Hi, I'm Karen Beach with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library Foundation and welcome to tonight's final draft home edition. Tonight our special author is Leslie Hooten and in a few minutes you're going to meet her and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you I have met Leslie a couple of times in passing but I've recently had a chance to chat with her for a few minutes and I want her to be my new best friend. You are going to love her. She is fantastic. So a couple of just housekeeping things before we get started. Um, uh, Leslie's book um, is available through the library. Um, unfortunately, it's available in print um, only. We don't have an e-copy of it yet. And there's a lot of holds on the book. And as you know, libraries are closed, so you can't check it out yet. But I encourage you to go to the library's website and go ahead and put a hold on her book. Um, the second thing is that Park Road Books and Main Street Books both would love to sell you her book um, while you're home and are happy to ship that to your home. So take advantage of that. And then lastly, um, if you join us typically for Final Draft in person, you know that normally we come to you for Final Draft at Town Brewing, but of course we're closed. So um, soon we'll be back hopefully to our physical home for Final Draft at Town Brewing. In the meantime, we hope you will continue to check them out if you need a growler or a bite to eat and check out their, um, check out their Facebook or social media feeds. They're doing some specials right now, and I think we'll even deliver some beer to your home. So check them out as well. Um, so as I mentioned tonight, our guest is Leslie Hooten. And Leslie is the author, um, debut author of the novel Before Anyone Else. Her book was published in late March. And so that was in the time when all of us were suddenly you know, staying at home. And so unfortunately, Leslie's mini book tour events were canceled or postponed. And so we are lucky enough tonight to bring her to Final Draft Home Edition. Um, Leslie uh, grew up in Alabama and received her undergraduate and graduate degrees from Auburn University. She went on to get a law degree at Samford University, but she's lived here in Charlotte for 30 years now. So I want to welcome Leslie to the Final Draft Home Edition. Leslie, Thanks, are you Karen. It's wonderful to see you and I'm so excited to talk with you about your book a little bit. I am one of the sad ones in that I haven't gotten my hands on an actual copy of your book yet to read since it just came out. There you go, Leslie, hold it up there. Perfect. So we can see. This is my first rodeo, so I don't know how to hold a book. <laughs> That's what it looks like. It, it is beautiful. I actually, let, we should talk about the cover too, but let me give you a quick summary of Leslie's book and why I'm excited to read it because I love, I love a good um, romance or a romantic comedy um, book as well. So, and she has lots of great um, book blurbs as they call it in the business. Other authors who say such beautiful things about your writing. Kevin Wilson called it a beautiful book. And Kevin Wilson, we had at Verse and Vino this past year. Um, we're going to talk about Leslie and her friendship with Kevin a little bit later. I'm going to ask you some questions about that. Also, the romantic debut we've been waiting for, said Patty Calhoun, um, Callahan Henry of New York Times bestselling author of Becoming Mrs. Lewis. So um, before anyone else is about 30 year old Bailey Ann Edgeworth. And I'm so intrigued that you set this book within the restaurant industry and what that's about. But this character, um, she kind of transforms her own life and moves from Atlanta to New York. She's got some rejection. She um, has some betrayal. Things go awry and she learns a lot about herself. And I'm not going to do the book summary justice. I'm going to let Leslie, if you will share a little bit about the book. And first of all, kind of how, how did you come to write before anyone else? Well, everyone's writing process is different, but it was like ingredients scattered along your counter and they were I didn't know which ones connected so I was going to a divorce attorney in the morning and then to a dementia center to visit my once brilliant mother in the afternoon and I was really too tired to when I got home to, and I fell into bed and the only thing I really enjoyed looking at was architectural digest and veranda 
<laughs> and I got intrigued by the idea of these before and after rooms and architectural digest, Karen. And, it, and it's all thing. about transformation. And I thought, gee, if rooms could be transformed, could people? And mm -hmm. is the transformation big or little or, you know, blonde to a brunette? Or, I mean, they don't have to be seismic. They can be little. And so that was, the, that those two things sort of, melded together and I was eating out a lot and chefs were very nice to me and chatted with me and I always took a notebook with me and took notes mm -hmm. and they are charming lot and so I thought ooh, and I don't cook so why don't I design the restaurant <laughs> I being Bailey and um, I didn't recall a, a book about a restaurant design mm -hmm. so I thought mm -hmm. ooh. It could be mine. And then my next door neighbor, Annie, called me her bae. And I was like, what is that? And she <laughs> said, it's like your best friend. And I went to the Google machine and I Googled <laughs> BAE and it meant before anyone else. And I uh -huh. thought, wow, that would make a great title of a book. So finally, the ingredients sort of simmered around in the, in the pot and I came up with the, the ideas co-mingled and Bailey Ann Edgeworth was born actually she was born at Mercy Hospital because I was sitting with mom in the recovery room and I, I knew that her name had to be those initials so. mm -hmm. and that's Fancy. where men call her and that's what men call her bae uh-huh that's yeah. what her men call her yeah. her men call her um so I mentioned that you have you have a lot of lovely um, kind of reviews by other authors, and one of those is Kevin Wilson, who you and I were chatting a little bit earlier about how much we both loved Kevin Wilson. But you've actually had a friendship with Kevin Wilson for a long time, and I know that's you um, you're part of a or been attending the Suwannee Writers Conference for many years. I think you shared, and we've heard from other authors sometimes. Um, a writing group is really important to them. Will you tell us a little bit about what the Swanee Writers Conference is and who, who some of your friends are and how that how that's really helped you become a writer over the years? Okay, I'm going to name drop here because there are some pretty good people up there. And Karen, it is my happy place. Other than my computer writing, mm -hmm. I would say Swanee is my happy place. And it's on this mountain, I call it the beloved mountain. And I've been, you have to be accepted. And I've been going for 15 or 20 years. And I've studied with people like Jill McCorkle and we've become good friends. She is, I, I have dubbed her my head cheerleader because she's mm -hmm. so, she's been so supportive of my work. And Kevin was just a student when I met him, but he wasn't even married. And he was writing these funny little dark things and reading them. And I'm like, you, either you've got a screw loose or you're just <laughs> my kind of guy. So we just became friends because I'm kind of quirky too. And that was that. And then I, I got to know Alice McDermott and um, she's won a National Book Award. Margot Livesey, who also yeah. wrote the book, and then a contemporary of mine was Amy Green, who were who writes for Knopf. She writes Appalachia, and it's really amazing literature. Um, and um, when I took this up there, I was like, "Now, y'all, this is not my usual stuff, but I needed to write something for me. I needed to be happy because mm -hmm. I had all this." turmoil going on in my personal life and I just wanted to be happy and write something pretty and and when the author when the cover artist read the book she said Leslie all I could see was beauty and mm -hmm. and that just pleased me I'm like she got me because one of Bailey's little taglines is life is too short not to be surrounded by beauty so I love that that's really beautiful so um, I mentioned that your book came out, I think it was March 24th, I think was the publication date. And as a first time author, that had to have just been so exciting, right? For the date to come and go. What was that like? <laughs> I'm like, who wrote the book on how to publish your first book during a pandemic? 
pandemic. I'm like, I don't see that on the shelves because I would look at, I would read it. I'm like, this was, it was so weird not to have any, my event at, at Park Road was canceled. My friends had given me this lovely luncheon. It was canceled. And then the other thing that I had a, an event at Parnassus with Kevin. It Which is canceled. a big deal. That's like, a, that's like the big deal, right? That's Mecca. Yeah. And then I had one in Chapel Hill with Jill. So, I, and I was going to call those conversations with friends because I was so grateful that they were sort of throwing me a lifeline at, and they known how hard I've worked. And so I was grateful. And then to be at home, you know, my phone not ringing, you know, none of, so it, it just was strange and I mean, I don't know. This is my first book, so I don't know what it's like the other way. So, anyway, what were you hoping your first tour would have been like? What What do you think you would have loved about being out on book tour? Well, Karen, when I started writing, my goal was a to please me, but the other goal was I was kind of lonely as a child, and I just wanted to write a book that it would connect to one other person that they wouldn't feel lonely and that they could maybe feel beauty in their own life and they could mm -hmm. see something different. And so that what I don't, I don't have the normal goals that most people do, but that was my goal is to meet people and just hear what they had to say, good and bad. And so I missed that, but, Social media has allowed me to connect with readers and Good. some people have been so done in by this coronavirus that they haven't wanted to read. But then they picked up Bay and they said, I found my love of reading again. Well, oh, that's wow. like the biggest compliment you could give me. Oh. That would have been the biggest compliment you could give my mother. So by proxy, it, it was a good compliment for me. So it's been rewarding. It's been the, it's been truly rewarding. Yeah. Even though well, I haven't left my house. Well, I hope that um, when things go back a little bit to normal, that you'll be able to um, have a sense of a book tour, because I think that people will just love meeting you um, in person. Tell us a little bit about, you grew up in a small town in Alabama. I think um and you, your mother is a librarian, and I think you've told me that an aunt was also a librarian. Tell us a little bit about growing up in that small town in Alabama. What was that like, and, and why was the library important to you growing up? Well, a small town, you know, there's not a lot of, like, things to do. My grandfather was sort of the Atticus Finch of the town. He was a lawyer. I'm a fourth generation lawyer, but everybody knew who I was. Um, mm -hmm. And that sort of gave me Bailey's um, quest to be her own person. I, I say that Bailey didn't want to be Hank's daughter, Henry's sister, and whatever mm -hmm. she was to Griffin. And I too struggled with that. I wanted to be find my own identity and find my own way. But growing up in a small town was probably divine for me because you get to see people and their personalities up close. And so you study them. And mm -hmm. I, because my mother was a librarian and because I spent so much time in a wheelchair, I would go to the library and be safe and be happy and I called it the great equalizer because mm -hmm. yeah. I felt like in in a book I had equal I could go anywhere anybody else could so it it allowed me it it kind of channeled my imagination it was like it the, my library card was like steroids for my imagination Oh, and so my mother encouraged it. She, she, t I was telling Landis this, she, she taught me alliteration when I was 10 and she used Robert Browning's poem, Ode to a Spanish Cloister. And the line was, mm -hmm. what are your damn flower pots do? And she said, now Leslie, 
that's a bad word, but see, <laughs> you see how the alliteration makes it so slow. So I was like, great, now I can say a bad word, but it's, it's, it's a poem, so what is she going to do about it? Right. Oh, that's too funny. Um, what we heard from another author recently who told us her favorite people watching spot as far as where she might get some inspiration for some some character traits or whatnot. Do you have do you have a favorite people watching spot? I mean, where do, where are you getting your ideas? Oh, um, my ideas, Karen, kind of come. I love to people watch. I find other people vastly more interesting than me. So whether I'm in an airport or whether I'm in a restaurant, mm -hmm. restaurant is a great place to yeah, watch. Okay. And because, you know, you, you see that couple and you try to guess, are they on a date? Uh -huh. Have they been married five years? Is it going away? You know, so right. restaurant is a good place. Okay. The church is a good place because mm. people doze all people <laughs> look around and you're wondering, oh, are they looking at Susie's dress that she wore last week? Or, right. you know, so, and I would just give them little thought bubbles. And I thought everybody did that. I didn't know I was strange. And um, so, I, and the library is an interesting uh people watching place because yeah. a lot of people go there if they're lonely and yeah. it's the librarians are your friends and I always felt they were the sweetest people I guess because I grew up with them that I felt like they were family kind of so I felt so, always safe it was always a safe place for me but I you can people watch anywhere I can go to the end of my driveway and that's people watching <laughs> material I love that you said um, restaurants are one of your favorite places to people watch because I do that too. I think about like, what's their story? But Jenny asked, I just noticed a question came up. So this is related, which is, um, do you have a favorite restaurant in Charlotte? Yes. Yes, I do. And I can't tell you because <gasps> oh, no. I, 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 I use so many restaurants. Thanks, <laughs> Jenny, for getting me in trouble with all my eateries. But um <laughs> I go. I, I studied a lot of restaurants and a lot of these chefs at restaurants. One of the places was Lou Mayer, which is now closed, so I can't mention them. Yeah. The the bartender came and sat with me one night and made me cocktails to try. I mean, I had to Uber home. Nice. I'm not very far from <laughs> Lou Mayer, but I had to Uber home. And he and I said, "Oh, you're such a good bartender, mm -hmm. James." And he goes, mixologist. And so that's sort of a, a gag that goes through uh -huh. the book too. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, that bar, that Griffin is a bartender and she says, no, 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 you're a mixologist. So mm -hmm. uh, they they were very kind with their time. And so I can't, sorry, Denny. Um, uh, it's like, if you include one, you're excluding them. Yeah. So I don't want people to be. We won't make so. you call one out tonight. So you had shared a little bit earlier with me. David how... Diller would probably tell you Napa. Uh, okay. David Dillard. All right. I think he's online. So Napa, we got that. Um, you had mentioned a little earlier to me about you have, I think I'd ask you when you started writing, when did you start writing? And you've shared that you've always been writing. But you shared offline that you wrote your first book at the age of 16, which was a really fun story that one of my other coworkers enjoyed. So will you tell us about what you wrote at 16? What was your inspiration? <laughs> okay. Love, a love sick girl, all she needs is a good song. And it was Barry Manilow, Weekend in New England. And I heard that song <laughs> and these characters just popped into my head and I had never been to Boston, never been to Cape Cod. And so my mother said, well, let's say you could you not do the song and, and set it in some place like Gulf Shores where you've been. I'm like, well, mama, what's the fun in that? I want to go somewhere. And Barry yeah. has taken me to Cape Cod <laughs> and he's talking about yearning. And my mother's like, Ooh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm liking where this is going, but she typed it and she liked it. I mean, it was a sophomore, not even, it was a freshman attempt. 
and then I wrote my second one at 22. When people, when girls were dating at the dorm and everything, I was just writing my little stories long-handed. So, and it's set in, it, it set in Boston too. I, I guess I just had to get my itch scratched until I could go to Boston. Did you ever live in Boston? Never, hmm. but I loved it. When I went, it was just like, it was one of those cities, you know, that I I had read about in the encyclopedia and wanted to go. So, I I just love, I you know, it was it was great. Tell us a little bit. Often we have people and folks online might have questions for you about this, but oftentimes we have um, folks who who yearn to be a writer, who yearn to be a published writer, and always wonder about could I do that. Tell us about what was your kind of process of getting published? Like, how did you actually become a published author? What oh, was that quit like? yearning. I mean, do something else. Um, um, well, I, as I said, I've been going to the Writers Conference for like 20 years. And I finally asked Jill about five years ago if she could just take up my writing over in case something happened to me. Because, Karen, I'm 60 now, so... You know, it's a big birthday, and I'm getting my book like published. And um, but I I got a, I acquired an agent at Swanee based upon my memoir title and the first sentence of my memoir, and she loved it. And she her name is Gail. She represents uh-huh. Scott Turow and Michael Cunningham, and, wow. and she wanted to represent me, so I was co- totally gobsmacked. So. I said, of course, but she, she, I think I was kind of like her circus animal. She didn't know what to do with this little quirky little woman from, you know, the South. And we, we parted and then I met the president of Turner and she, she didn't want me to send it to him because she said he doesn't, they don't pay anything because they're small press, which is true, but they gave me this beautiful cover. And so they loved my book and the woman, the acquisitions editor is related to James Beard. So she just ate up all the cooking, the, the cooking and the dining yeah. business. So yeah. it, it, I'm very, I'm so happy to be, I'm kind of happy to be at Small Press actually, because they've been so nice to me. That's fantastic. So um, I think you told me that you turned in your second manuscript today. Is today, today, last was today? week, last week. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit, what is your next project? It is, it's called What Remains Behind, which is from a William Wordsworth poem. Um, and it's set in a little town in Alabama, South mm-hmm. familiar, and it's about friendship, funeral casseroles, and lucky doves. <laughs> and I would say it was a cross between the the Crawdad book and uh-huh. the Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. Okay. And tell us the name again. We're going to be on the lookout for What that. Remains Behind. It's what like remains we behind. will not um, think about the splendor in the grass, the glory of the flower, uh-huh. but we will grieve. We will grieve not, but remember what remains behind. It's Intimations of Immortality by William Wordsworth. Uh-huh. I love that. And funeral casseroles. You got to work that in as a Southern writer. And Lucky does. I mean, yeah. they were asking me, what is a line from this book? And I said, the protagonist's best friend's name is Wynne. And her name was Wynn. We called her Wynn. And she did at everything her whole damn life. <laughs> and I said to the editor, I said, you don't need to know what wind looks like because we all have winds in our life. So mm-hmm. is she blonde? Is she brunette? Chances are she's tall and pretty and skinny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell us, um, Talia actually asked, one of our folks online asked, um, what's your favorite book or what are you reading now that you might recommend? Two part question. Um, books for me are like children. It's hard to single one out. And at different points in my life, you know, other, some things will come into focus, but I think the one I keep returning to, and I've mentioned, you know, the Atticus Finch, mm-hmm. I think it has to be To Kill a Mockingbird, and I'm sorry yeah. to be kind of yeah. uh, plain about that, but when I read it, it was like, oh my goodness, 
she's written my life because you know there's we had cats as currency in my family mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. like Atticus and the and the sweet potatoes and stuff like that so I grew up a lot like Harper and I'm probably quirky like she is and I don't write I'm not saying I write like her but um I just thought she had I'm like oh she's written my story you know she so I, I it, it's just a such a soft spot um how has the quarantine affected your writing or what you're doing I mean we're all staying at home but has that given you more time to write you've talked about before that you always had a lot of time as a child by yourself maybe while others were doing other things and so you you wrote a lot so has quarantine affected your writing not in a vast way I mean I know I kind of see it as a blessing, Karen, because I would be out touring and um, doing a lot of stuff. And I have really taken to the Zoom. I love to do Zoom book clubs because I can I can work at my you know at my desk and then I can put a little makeup on and show up for book book clubs. I do miss people and miss yeah. miss the the connection because um, I think the connection is so important and I, 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 I would miss that. So I do miss that, but I, I've just been writing and I don't know if they are going to like this next book or not. It may be just for, for, to get me through the coronavirus. And, <laughs> you know, I, as I said, they saved my life. And maybe this, it's a sequel actually, and Ooh, it may just be for me. And yeah. um, it may just be for me, but it is saving my life during this, this time. Writing has saved my life. And I know that's kind of hyperbole, but it's, it's true because when you're, when you have a lot of surgery and you're in a wheelchair and you're sort of by yourself, you know, you need friends and, mm -hmm. I, I just created mine. <laughs> I just created my friends. So imagination is a beautiful thing. Friends, but yeah. I created them when I was little and young. Yeah. yeah. We've got, um, we have lots of folks saying miss you and good to see you and congrats on the book. A um, couple of questions coming in. So if you do have questions for Leslie, put them there in the comment box and we'll try to get to those pretty quickly. Did have one from Tracy Curtis that said, um, what advice would you give to writers hoping to be published? Bless you, Tracy. Tracy is one of those friends that is that is in my beloved village. She read Bay <clears throat> in the early incarnations, and she said, "This is good." You know, she she's one of those cheerleaders too. Um, if you are really serious about it, you have to be disciplined. So I would say, sit in a chair. And one word, begin. You just, mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> if if I can, I mean, say I've written for 15 years, 20 years, Karen, and what, either I'm an idiot or I have reckless abandonment with, with writing. And you just, you have to sort of adopt a Winston Churchill view if you're really serious about it. Never give up, never yeah. give up, never give up. It's great advice for a lot of things in life. Yes. Yeah. Um, other questions. I really, yeah, that was a great question from Tracy. Um, you have, uh, so are you still, are you doing a, are you a blogger as well? Do you do other kind of writer writing? Yes. I, I, I have written blogs in the past. I wrote about my mother's death. She did die. And Sorry. I was very, uncomfortable with everybody would re remember her anniversary Karen and mm -hmm. I said and I wrote a blog about it I said I, I don't, I'm not happy with this I, I I think Elizabeth and I will refer to my mother as Elizabeth or Sarge so if you hear those two words that, that uh, that's my mother but I just think she had a change of address you know I I, mm -hmm. I think she's just merely had a dress change her her address in my estimation is more prominent than mine but you know i'm sure she's looking down saying i i hope you don't goof all this. 
Because I think you told me earlier, right? She was your first editor. She was always your editor. Always right? she wrote, she typed my first book. She typed my second book. And I mean, she was the one that came up with the phrase, which is in the dedication, uh, red ink is love, Leslie. And she never said, I love you much, but she said red ink is love. And so when I saw all my manuscripts with all this red ink on even my letters that I would send to her mm -hmm. in college that just be they would bleed and I was and, and she said red ink is love so mm -hmm. I knew that they were if if they had that much red ink then they could be fixed and so if I got something that didn't have any marks on it that that's an upset thing to me I'm like oh they must have not liked it because they didn't uh -huh. comment all oh it. yeah I love that. We've got one last question for you, I think, this evening, which is from Jean, which is, um, how do we get you to Zoom with our book club or with a book club? So see, even though we're all at home, could we Zoom with, could, could book club Zoom with you? Yes, I would love to Zoom. Just reach out. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I have, Excellent. you know, any, just let me know. I'm happy to do it. I clearly you, you threw me for a loop because I was ready to Zoom tonight because I figured it out. Thanks to David <laughs> Diller. And I was like, what is this? Steam yard. I'm not ready for this. So this is where this is the background you'll see when I zoom. But I would love to because I that's my ability to connect with people. It's yeah. still it's still there. We're just doing it in a different way. So you heard it here first, folks. Um, you can contact Leslie and she will, she will join you for a book club session while we're all at home or maybe even later. So I want to say, Leslie, thank you so, so much for being with us tonight for final draft home edition. Um, I, I can't wait to get my hands on a copy of your book and read it. I know it's going to be fantastic because I've so enjoyed just talking with you. Um, so I want to encourage everybody to check out your book, go ahead and put it on hold at the library or call or um, email Park Road Books or Main Street Books, and they will ship you a copy while we're all at home. Sally has been, I want to do a shout out to Park Road Books. Yeah. They have been fabulous. So, um, and Sally's doing a yeoman's job over there. Um, yeah. she, I don't know when the when she sleeps, but she's do, been doing a fabulous job. Thank you. So, um, don't forget, folks, it's before anyone else. Leslie, will you hold up the book for us one more time? Can you do that? Gladly. Before, any, before anyone else, there we go, came out March 24th. Lots of fantastic reviews. You got to read it. And congrats, Leslie, for um, your first book being published, even though you've been writing for a long time, first book published. Big congrats to you. Well, thank you. Uh, um there's a quote in the book about sometimes our dreams come true, just not the way we, our mind envisioned. And, you know, didn't envision a pandemic, but this has been lovely, you know, just yeah. getting to talk to you and other people. It's nice. Well, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you in person soon. And I want to remind everybody that Thursday night, we're going to be back with you Thursday night, seven o'clock for um, the final draft home edition. Our author on Thursday night, is Patrice Gopo. And Thursday night, we'll wrap up. We've been doing Final Draft Home Edition for five weeks. Um, and so Thursday night's gonna wrap that up. We're gonna take a little break from that, but we do hope you will join us on um, Thursday night here, same place, seven o'clock. Um, a reminder again, you can welcome to um, go ahead and put Leslie's book on hold through cmlibrary.org, or we'll hope you'll um, uh, purchase one through Park Road Books or Main Street Books or two local independent bookstores. They would love your business right now for that. And then you heard Leslie talking about so eloquently, way more than I could ever share about um, the, the um, importance of libraries and how they have played a role in her life. So if you are able to and so inclined to support the library, we would always love your support. Um, you can find out more information on how to do that at foundation.cmlibrary.org so you can continue to bring library services and impact many other children's and their imagination like Leslie as a young child. Um, until then, I think those are all my wrap ups for tonight. It's been wonderful um, to have you. 
And congrats again to Leslie. And we'll hope to see you on Thursday night. Thanks so much. Good night.